Hi everyone, Ezreal Knight here, and welcome to the first episode of Days of Night for 2021. I just finished off my mini series, Darkroom Nights 2021, and uh, I'll let you guys know when the box set is all ready. I've had a couple minor setbacks, like making a box out of the box set. The box that I chose uh, is now not in stock, so I'm going to have to look for another one. And shipping prices from the US are pretty steep. But the selection from the U.S. is so much better than I've found in Canada, so it's a bit of a balance. That being said, I will keep you updated. I'll throw it up at the end of an episode uh, one day randomly, and then you'll know how to get your hands on one. For now, though, we are heading back into first impressions of film and camera territory, and today is a double bill. First impressions of a film and first impressions of a camera. For the camera, I'm going to be introducing you to the Minolta Maximum 50. A bit of a mystery of a camera, I couldn't find too much information on it. It was released in 2004, and that's about all I know. Its kit lens is a 28 to 100 millimeter, which I happen to have. And, you know, fiddling around with it, getting to know it before I go on camera, it seems to be a pretty user-friendly model. It should be interesting. It is a very plastic camera but we'll see if that makes a difference. And today's first impressions for film is Kodak Technical Pan, a film that was discontinued in 2004, right when our camera was released. It tends to shift towards the red, which means today will be dark blues and bright reds. And what I mean by that is black blues and white reds because we are talking about black and white film. For today's field trip, I'm gonna be heading over to Morley, Alberta, an old familiar place. Now there's a bit of a backstory to this. There was a church there a few years ago and I did a first impressions on actually a digital camera, the Canon T2i. Here's some footage from that. Just outside of Morley, Alberta at the McDougall Memorial United Church. Actually my ancestor built this. I think the main challenge for me is going to be recording something unique. Um, I've been here a few times before. I'll put up some photos now to show you that. Um, essentially, I want to try and capture it like I haven't before. And yeah, just a beautiful spot with a beautiful church. I love churches. I'm not religious at all, um, but I do love a beautiful church, especially an old church. And this particular church was built by my ancestors, George and John McDougall, a fifth great uncle and cousin, basically. One week later, uh, someone burnt it to the ground, and here's my reaction to that. And uh, today I'm afraid I have some bad news. Um, the church that I vlogged about, uh, the one that my ancestor George McDougall built 150 years ago, uh, has burned to the ground. Was pretty shook up and uh, uh, she informed me what had happened. Fire erupted in the middle of the night. Someone who spotted the flames and plumes of smoke called the fire department. To those who care for and restore this church, they suspect it was intentionally set. There was no power or heat in the building. It couldn't be anything else virtually. Uh, it's so senseless. What's, what's, what I'm completely floored about is the fact that I was I was just there a week ago, like, and it was so beautiful, and so many of you watched it. Somebody said that they were re-inspired, and, and now it's just gone, like, and everything in it. Um, there were obviously photos and artifacts, an 1850s piano that uh, McDougall brought on, across Canada on Ox. As you can see, I was very upset. It was not a happy time. There is some controversy around churches um, near and on reservations that were built around this time in Canada. Uh, that being said, I'm on my third book um, written by George or John McDougall. And as far as I can tell, they loved the native people and um, I know intentions aren't an excuse, but, um, you know, it has to count for something, I think. And as far as I can tell, they had the best intentions during this time period. Um, and the church was built with love. It was not built out of malice or to, or to destroy 
a culture. I don't, I don't believe that. But setting all that controversy aside, churches from a purely architectural standpoint are a beautiful thing to photograph, especially out in Alberta's um, outback. Now, what I found out a couple of days ago is that the society that is responsible for that land rebuilt the church using a lot of the old materials and it's finished the church is back up and from the photos it looks identical and i'm gonna head down there today and have myself a look and take some photos and enjoy nature in all its glory it's not a very long drive either and that's one of the things i love about living in southern alberta is that you don't have to drive far to get away from the civilization of the big city with all that being said i think you're in for an interesting episode let's get started Here she is, the Minolta Maxim 50. My copy looks pretty good, actually. There uh, doesn't seem to be too many scratches. The bottom plate is the real indication if it was overused, and it looks pretty decent. Like I said, it's got what I think is the kit lens, a 28 to 100, 3.5 to 5.6. Let's take a look at some of its features. First off, it takes two CR2 batteries. Just pop them in here face up. And it comes to life as soon as you pop them in. Just about everything here is going to be controlled from this dial. First thing it's going to do is ask you to set the date because this is a date stamp camera. Right now I've got it set to off. Um, most of the functions here is going to be a matter of setting it to the dial, holding the function button, and then using the main dial in the front here to change between the settings. So aperture priority, shutter priority, manual, and program. Right here are the focus points, again holding the function button and switching between them. I like to keep it on center. A choice between auto and manual focus. You also have bracketing options here, changing the speed of your film. In this case, we're going to be working with 25 today. I'm pretty sure Kodak Technical Pan will have the um, automatic speed check. Here's where you can set how the date will be displayed. In this case, I have it off, but you can change between them. It's good to know that as soon as you pull the batteries out, the date will be reset because I set the date and then I pulled the batteries out. Um, if you wanna set the date, then you just come down to this dial and you work your way through. Hold it down to change it and then let go and then dial in to figure it out. Oh, it does look like I still have it. Wicked. Anyway, it's a pretty simple camera. There's not a lot of bells and whistles. You've got a self timer over here as well as your flash options. I could tell you right away, the first annoyance that I have is that it looks like it has Minolta's proprietary hot shoe. So you can't put any old flash on here, you have to put on one of Minolta's. So be wary of that. Okay, let's load this thing with some film. I just wanna give a shout out to Donald Davis for giving me this roll of film amongst others, but uh, this is one of them. And I really, really appreciate the donation. Thanks again to Donald. I tend to come up with nicknames for people. Um, you know, we've got Chicago Bill and the real of Peter. So Donald Davis will eventually come up with a nickname for you as well. <laughs> Maybe something strange will happen to this film that will earn that nickname. Who knows? Anyway, it's out of love. I'm not, I'm not trying to make fun of people, but um, yeah, Donald donated, <laughs> Donald donated a bunch of roles and uh, this is one of them and it's really appreciated. Let's have a closer look at this thing. So TP stands for technical pan, expired September, 2004. Kodak worldwide sponsor of the Olympics. Yeah, let's bust it open. Nice. Ah yes, back in the day when Kodak actually provided information on the inside. So it looks like it's providing filter information here. 
And then down here, we seem to have a contrast index. Interesting. Let me take a moment to read this. Fascinating. So depending on the developer you use, it has different ISOs here. And it's not very straightforward, actually. Like, for example, if you used D19, it's 100 to 160. Um, and if you used HC110 Delusion B, it's 100 to 250. Um, now, I've already consulted the massive dev chart, and I'm pretty sure I'm going to be using Rodinol today. Uh, Rodinol is a 1 to 50 uh, development ratio, and that will give me a speed of 25. That is what I'm going to focus on. Here's the film itself. Interesting. It is not DX coded like I thought it would be. So yeah, I'm going to be doing most likely a 25 speed on this. And I'm lucky because the maxim allows me to make a custom speed of right down to six. All right, that sounded like a loaded. Frame number one is listed there. All right, let's head out. Something I didn't anticipate is that it's uh, closed and kind of cut off. Not completely, I can sort of walk up to it, but they've got a fence all the way around it. Um, the one thing I'm really happy about is that it looks like they've got 24 hour video surveillance on it now to at least help prevent, um, you know, it being burnt to the ground again. So I'm not going to be able to get as up close and personal as I thought I was going to be with it, but I've definitely got a better view of it than I did when it was burnt to the ground and there was a giant fence in front. Okay. <clears throat> I want to make this quick because I hear the sound of car tires nearby, but I don't see any lights on and it's kind of freaking me out. I'm going to show you real quick with one of my studio lights, the damage. But I'm going to be like a beacon in the night for a moment. So I want to make sure and do this fast. There it is. Pretty bad. It's just uh, an old fashioned wooden fence now. So just a couple of poles. I'm not going to break. Uh, at least I don't think I'll be breaking trespassing rules by um, going up to it and photographing it. Thankfully, the Minolta has a maximum focal length of 100 millimeters, so I'll be able to get in a little tighter. But yeah, it's a little disappointing, but it doesn't totally shut down my production for the day. So far, so okay. I've used the bracketing feature a couple of times. It looks like it only does bracketing in half stop or full stop increments. Um, the church looks identical except for a couple things. No steps leading up to the door yet. And the wood looks new. I actually half expected it to smell like new paint, 
but uh, because I can't get close enough, I can't tell. One thing is that the camera will not shoot in shutter priority if it can't open up the aperture uh, enough to take the shot. Um, and I feel like once or twice it was either too cold or the lens wasn't on properly enough uh, in order for it to register the aperture. I switched to aperture priority to try and solve the issue because uh, there's more shutter speeds than there are aperture settings. Um, but yeah, it showed two blank lines when I switched to aperture priority, which is why I was thinking that it was potentially uh, an issue with the connection of the camera itself. But uh, I've been able to wiggle it around and get it going. As far as using it in general is concerned, it, uh, you know, it feels like uh, your average middle to maxim, but a little cheaper. There is some giant dookie, and it is all over the place. I'm now behind the church, by the river, still frozen over because it's January. It's how close we are to the mountains right now. It's a little chilly, but it is beautiful. It might be starting to snow a little. I'm more concerned about the wildlife, though. Whatever pooped that up. <laughs> oh my god. Definitely having some troubles with this camera. It keeps engaging and then re-engaging. I want to say that it's the cold, but I can't be certain because I'm not testing this in the summertime. I'm just going to hold the camera like, I don't know, I'm going to wrap my hand around the... Whew, it's chilly. I'm basically just going to hold the lens for the next couple of minutes and see if that takes care of it. If you see my eyes dart, it's because, oh, is that wildlife? Am I seeing some wildlife? Am I stepping in dookie? <laughs> anyway, um, it's interesting. The landscape is definitely different from the last time I was here. Um, you guys saw the footage. I was um, out on a mud platform, basically. And, uh, yeah, there's a fence here. I don't remember there being a fence here. There's another 24-hour surveillance sign. I hope I'm not breaking any rules. I don't think I am. Everything that's been opened, I've gone through. Everything that's been closed, I've avoided. So right now I'm on shot number 24. I'm going to get a couple more snaps of the lake here, and then I'm going to get the uh, church as I get back. And if I bracket, that'll pretty much take care of it for today. A short journey, you know, a fairly quick roll to shoot here, basically because there's only two subject matter, the church and the river. You know, I like to bracket when I don't know what to expect with this film. If I didn't say it already, actually I know I didn't say it already, um, this film was frozen since new. So I'm able to shoot it at box speed, but still, I don't know how it's going to behave. And I don't know how this camera is going to behave either. What if the shutter speed is slow? What if for some reason it's quick? I mean, it's never quick when they get old. They always slow down. Uh, in translation, they stay open for longer, the shutter speed that is. But, um, you know, just in case the metering is off, it's just a good idea. Yeah, I'm going to go ahead and say there's definitely something wrong with the camera. Um, and it's not um, exposure clipping because I switched to program mode and I got the same problem. If it wasn't an issue with the camera, then program should have worked. So I'm trying to see if warming it is the issue. I did switch to manual focus for one set of shots and the camera took its sweet time switching between auto and manual focus, which leads me to believe that it's a cold issue. Uh, not surprising. I mean, it's like minus two Celsius right now. So, and it's been getting more frequent as we go. I wish I had some hot paws. I don't think I've got hot paws in my bag and I've only got five shots left. So if this continues, I'm just going to rewind the film as is and call it a day. Okay, folks, I'm back home now. 
I am in the dark room and I am ready to develop this role. Now, a couple things before I get to it. Um, there was somebody that did show up at the site, but uh, I didn't see them and they didn't interact with me. I know it was somebody official and with the community because they were um, hauling a whole bunch of lumber and they had access into the gate. They had driven their truck, um, opened the gate, driven their truck uh, through the gate, and I'm really glad I wasn't blocking it, but I almost was. Um, and I'd parked like inside the uh, what would have been like area where I wasn't allowed one of the areas where I wasn't allowed so I didn't see anybody though and I wasn't gonna wait around to see if I saw anybody worst case scenario was they got my license plate and I'll get <laughs> a letter in the mail or something but honestly I was very respectful I don't think that um, I don't think I was breaking any laws I was on I was on the outside of all the fences and uh, the worst thing I did is have a pee in the bushes <laughs> Hopefully they don't have that on camera. Uh, anyway, as far as the camera is concerned, I couldn't get it. I, I, I was sick of fiddle farting with it. So I just uh, rewound at, I think, frame 35. So there's only going to be like one blank frame in this. I don't have a lot of confidence here. I really don't. The film door was kind of loose. Like you could push it and it would make a little back and forth kind of thing. I have no idea how the exposures will turn out if the lens wasn't attached to the camera properly. Also, I don't even I don't even know what this film looks like. I really like doing this blind. I like just seeing the results like for the first time because um, I feel like if I just went on Google and looked at a bunch of Google images and stuff like that, that it would sort of take away some of the magic for me. Yeah, with all that being said, I'm going to get this into the tank, and the next time you see me, I will be doing the final wash. Now, I always say I'm nervous because I'm usually testing something new, but I'm more nervous than usual for the following reasons. One, uh, that Maxim, I'm just, I'm looking over there at it, um, is a piece of crap. <laughs> Spoiler alert on the review. Um... It did not work very well for me. It was frustrating. I'll probably end up tossing it after this, or, I mean, you could try and sell it broken, but those cameras aren't very repairable. And then the second thing is, is I had the pre-wash come out as if I was working with a medium format. Now I know from checking Wikipedia that Technical Pan has some interesting chemicals. Most of you probably know more about Technical Pan than I do, but the one thing I learned is that when Kodak discontinued it in 2004, they admitted that they had stopped producing it for a very long time, and they had basically a giant batch of it that they found in a freezer somewhere, and that's how they kept producing it for a while. But um, it was a film used for the military. There's some kind of special formula to make it. Um, yeah, so... All right, just gonna pour this out and we'll see what we got here. Okay, I'll be happy if there are images at all. You know how that went once, if you watch my channel. That is slippery. Normally it just snaps right off, but for some reason it doesn't wanna snap right off. So I'm just going to, I know the suspense is killing you, but I'm going to get a paper towel here and hopefully I can unlock it that way. There we go. It's a little stuck for some reason. Okay, great. So the first thing that I want to say is that the film, it feels weird. After handling film hundreds of times, if not a thousand or more, I can tell that this is a different type of film. 
I definitely have exposures. Well, I gotta tell you, this is a huge relief that that I've got images. And from what I can tell, they look pretty good, pretty contrasty, pretty nifty looking. Um, yeah, totally relieved. The last thing I gotta do here is pop this into some photo flow and then hang it up to dry. No waiting for you though. Here are today's highlights and my contact sheet. Well, folks, I hope you enjoyed those. Not a ton of highlights today, and the main reason for that, as you saw, was because I did a lot of bracketing. For insurance purposes, because of the camera, because of the film, because of all that uncertainty, I tend to default to bracketing when I'm in those uncertain situations. First, I'm going to talk about the camera, then I will talk about the film. So not a lot to say about this camera. It is an early 21st century uh, consumer level SLR and it's when film was on its way out and they were trying to make things as cheap as possible. Man, in 2004, um, people were getting ready to see their first full frame SLR. I believe the Canon 5D Mark I was released in 2005. It's a weird crossover time because you had people that were probably starting to get fed up with film but still weren't seeing the digital results that they wanted to see. I can't imagine this camera was in production for very long. And I know a lot of cameras are plastic. I mean, this camera I'm shooting on here, this Fujifilm X-T100. It's a plastic camera, but there's a big difference between the plastic on this camera and the plastic on the Minolta Maxim 50. I can only really speak on my copy of the Minolta Maxim 50 but if you're thinking about buying a cheap SLR, uh, I would say there's a lot of other cameras at the same price that would probably do you a lot more justice. If you're looking for a Maxim camera, there are definitely other Maxim cameras that will do you a lot more justice. What did I like about the camera though? Um, I think the kit lens had a good range. 28 to 100 is... It's a really good range, like being able to zoom in on those mountains. That was that was nice. Uh, normally, you get a lot of uh, 28 to 80s or uh, 18 to 55s. And, you know, that's just a tease. It's to tease you to buy another lens. But Minolta was like, okay, we'll throw you a bone. We'll take you from the 70 millimeter range all the way to 100. And once you get to 100 millimeters, on a 35 millimeter camera, um, that's pretty telephoto. You can do some compression with that. And um, starting at 28, you've got a nice wide angle as well. For me, wide doesn't really start until 24. And I don't think it starts to look cool until you get to about 20 millimeters. Um, but 28 is still decent. It's still a decent wide angle. It's still gonna create some distortion if that's your thing. It's still going to bend things around you when you're in tight spaces. So there is that. Okay, let's talk about the film. So like I said, the film felt different. And I'm sure somebody in the comments can give me some details on that. Here's the number one thing with Kodak Technical Pen, though. At least developing at ISO 25 with Rodinol 1 plus 50. The midtones were just 
gone. Like it was all highlights and shadow detail and very little, if any, midtones. When I looked at my histogram while scanning, it was like two mountain peaks. You saw your shadow detail and then it dropped off to nothing. And then you had your highlight peak and that was it. Um, and I was actually, you know, it wasn't a really bright day. It wasn't super blue skies, but for some reason I was, I was picturing darker skies. That uh, weird liquid that came out at the beginning, I know now that that's probably just a byproduct of this particular film. And, you know, it didn't make any difference in my washing. I use a traditional Ilford 51020 washing method, and it didn't seem to be bothered by that whatsoever. I didn't notice any spots or streaking or anything like that. I prefer a flatter negative, and I want to be able to control the contrast myself. I've got a couple more rolls of this stuff, and I'm going to be using it again in the future, and I'm going to want to try a developer and speed combination that's going to give me a flatter negative. So I'll, I'll do a little research on that before I start that episode. Um, can't tell you when it's going to be. Sometime in the future. It's in the freezer. It's It's still good to go. The one other thing I wanted to mention is because the film felt different, it was a different uh, texture, I want to say, it was actually harder to sleeve. It, it really didn't want to, it didn't really want to get in there. And uh, that was a little frustrating. But those are my thoughts. Agree with me, disagree with me. Let me know in the comments. I know there's a lot of old timers out there that would love to share your experience with Kodak Technical Pan. Um, a better developer. I'm I'm thinking maybe Rodinal's not the best way to do it. I was really surprised that OnePlus 50 only called for a four and a half minute developing time. I feel like if there was a developer with a longer developing time, I'd be able to maybe get some more mid-tones out of it. Just guessing. But yeah, that's all for now. I really hope you enjoyed this episode. If you did, perhaps you'll join me on Patreon. I actually have a brand new perk just starting at the $1 level, and that is a brand new Discord server. Over on Discord, we are chatting up a storm about gear, um, about critiquing each other's photos. Uh, we have a weekly topic, and we even trade and sell gear. I've already sold a few Polaroids I was looking to get rid of. So um, if you're looking for cheap gear, or if you're looking for free advice, head on over to patreon.com slash Azrael, sign up for a dollar, and then you'll be automatically added to our Discord server. You can also follow me on Instagram and Twitter, and until next time, stay classic. <laughs>